Okay. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to the video. I think you guys will really enjoy this video. Uh, today, I'm talking with uh, Alan. He runs freecashflow.io. Uh, it's an agency helping uh, online entrepreneurs uh, basically do tax and accounting uh, because this feels very niche, right? So if you're an online entrepreneur doing e-commerce, e uh, SaaS, you sell courses, content creator, whatever it is online, right? Uh, he helps these types of clients. So uh, today, he's just, I think this video will be very of much value to you guys. Purely is going to break down uh, the top 10 tips, am I right, uh, Alan, that e-commerce yeah, owners right. you usually face uh, with the tax and accounting, right? So he's going to go through uh, it. And I think especially applicable, especially because uh, uh, he's in the US. So US gap law applies and stuff. So uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, I'll just let Alan take over from here. Uh, yep. Yeah. Alan, go ahead. Yeah. Hey guys. Um, and hey, hey, Jonathan, thanks for having me on your channel. Um, so my name is Alan Chen. I'm a CPA, which stands for Certified Public Accountant. And basically I run an agency that focuses mainly on online business owners, um, e-commerce, um, you know, SaaS or, you know, YouTube streamers, those, those kind of clients. And we're very focused on basically helping them maximize their tax deduction, helping them uh, ha have their books being ordered and, you know, provide all kinds of consultation for them. So uh, Jonathan invited me on his channel to basically provide you guys with some some tips. And I thought it'd be a good idea to gather, you know, the top 10 most frequently asked questions that e-commerce owners come and ask our agency. So uh, yeah, just want to give you guys some value back just before our tax season started. Yep. Okay. So I mean, uh, Alan, I think I give you screen share so you can. Okay. Go sounds ahead. good. Let me, uh, let me share my screen with you guys. Cool. Can you guys see this? Yep, I can see. Yep. Okay, cool. So yeah, just just, just again, um, our agency's name is uh, Free Cash Flow. It's uh, a little model's tax savings you can feel because we really want to emphasize on, you know, maximizing your after tax profit for you, all of you guys out there. So yeah, let me get started with you guys. Um, yep, so our topic today is going to be the top 10 most frequently asked e-commerce owners questions, and we're going to answer them all for you right here on this channel. So uh, before we get really started on everything, we just want to give a little disclaimer here. Obviously, um, everyone's situation out there is different. This is just a you know a YouTube channel uh, video on, on on internet, so we don't want to guarantee that um, everything we say here is going to apply directly to your situation. But you know, if you if you guys are interested or have a business that needs uh, accounting or tax help, we would love to set up a consulting call with you so we can get really personalized and you know really get to understand your situ your tax situation. But yeah, cool. Okay. And just a little bit about our mission. So our, our, our whole reason we, we started this business is to really help forward-thinking online business owners scale their business while ever worrying about accounting and tax issue ever again. Um, so uh, this is a little known fact, but I actually was an e-com owner myself uh, this past year. I really got to understand a lot of things about, you know, how to run an online business, all about <laughs> Facebook ads, how not to get banned on Facebook, Google, SEO, you know, uh, like designs, uh, site page optimization. So uh, I uh, got to understand how much time each thing take and how you should, you should be worried about scaling your business and not really worry about tax and, you know, accounting issues. So hopefully uh, with, with, some, with someone like me, you don't have to go, go in and do something like that anymore. Um, and then, uh, yeah. Um, so I want to just go over a little bit about like, a, like what, what we see as a typical e-commerce income statement. So what you have is maybe like what you have see as a top line revenue. So, um, you know, if a, if a business Shopify or Amazon, you could be making 1.5 million or more a year. So that'd be a top line. Your cost, what cost goods sold is basically your inventory cost. So that's like, say it's 400,000. Operating expense is basically everything else. So that, that would be your merchant fees. That'll be the amount you pay your VAs. That'll be your tax preparation, shipping, you know, everything else goes in here and say, and at the end of the day, your taxable income is around, we'll say seven hundred twenty thousand dollars right? So that means if you look at the right, that means you'll be taxed at the highest bracket if you're an individual filer, which means you're a single person, not married. Um, so that would be amount to about $230,000 of your taxable liabilities for the year. So that's great and all. And that's, you know, if you just hire a tax preparer, that's probably what they're going to say. Hey, 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 dude, this is what you're going to be paying. Um, but we want to kind of show you what will happen if you go and hire someone that really understands your business and really cares about, um, you know, trying to find ma and maximize your tax deduction. So this is, this is what uh, we see when we take on a client, right? So not only do we just take the face value of what you give us as your 
financial statements and your and your revenue. We go and try to find you know missed deductions, things that you you may have missed because your accountant didn't ask you to write questions about things that you're doing this year. And then we also find ways to help you accelerate your expenses. So for this particular client, we saw that there was an opportunity for them to actually buy their inventory in advance, right? So instead of buying it, say in 2022, they decided, hey, I can actually take on that inventory now and take that tax saving now, and then I can have greater cash flow so I can reinvest in other parts of my business. So you can see the, the really big effect here because they they do, they do all this, um, they only they're only getting a, a tax to about well, 199,000 and we saw that there was a tax credit they, they can uh, apply for and tax credits are amazing. So tax credits, if you guys don't know, is a dollar for dollar return on, on your taxes, which means if you take a $10,000 tax credit, you get all $10,000 back as a, almost like a refund for you. So when, when they take the $10,000 tax credit, the actual tax liability is only 189,000. So A and B, this is, this is the same client. This is basically before they came to us and after they came to us. And you can see the effect here. So that's forty thousand dollars in savings that they realize because you know they go and hire someone that really really want want them to see and do well and not just you know file their taxes for them. Uh, okay, could, could I ask so, a question? Yeah, of course. So I mean, like, uh, you go back one slide. Yep. You say at the thirty-seven percent tax bracket, right? Like, I'm sure different states have different taxes, uh, tax brackets, right? Thirty-seven is the highest. Oh yeah. So guessing. this is this yeah. is federal federal tax, Jonathan. Okay. So uh, yeah, so it applies to everyone in the United States. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, state tax is different. You're absolutely right. Okay. Yeah, so uh, if we want to talk about that, there is definitely advantages of living in certain states, say like Texas, which doesn't have a state income tax. Mm -hmm. So if you can actually be flexible, so that's a great tip. If you can actually move your operations around and say move everything to Texas, only set up your nexus there. Hey, I'm in California and we have very high state income tax here. Mm -hmm. So if you can move out of state and just do, do it in a no income state tax, that's more power to you. Okay. Yep. Cool. Any other questions? No, nope. we move on. Okay, cool. So we're gonna jump right in. So we're just gonna go do the top ten most asked questions that, of our agency from from our different clients that we have. So number one, of course, we always get is is my ad spend tax deductible? So that can include you know Facebook, Google, or Snapchat, really anywhere that you go and you know you go do and pay ads, right? So um, just good news is you know all advertising expense are deductible, so you don't have to worry about that. So uh, one really important tip for you guys is of course always gather all, all your reports through the, you know, the Facebook admin portal, do uh, Google to make sure you are maximizing it and you're not losing out any deductions. Um, and it includes a lot of categories. So uh, you don't, you're not just restricted to online advertising, right? You can, you can do TV ads. I know uh, like uh, performance TV is a, is a big thing right now you know, on streaming, uh, magazines, uh, even promotions on business cards, brochures, uh, promotional stuff. Like if you, if you guys are uh, eight, eight, nine figure guys uh, and are promoting a, a sports team for anything, right? That's tax deductible, so don't worry about it. If you want to go go and sponsor the Golden State Warriors or something like that, um, and then another pro tip is this is probably not something that's probably post COVID, but say you're hosting a promotional event at a uh, event show, right, and you want to offer them food, uh, that's also deductible. So if you want to go offer some lobster bites to to your to your uh, customers, yeah, totally totally fine. Cool. So that's, that's question number one. Uh, do you have any questions, Jonathan? Before I move on? Uh, no, I think quite straightforward. This, yeah. Okay. Awesome. So question number two is how about my inventory? What if, and what if I am drop shipping, right? So that's something that we always get as the next most frequently asked question. Um, so inventory is actually an interesting topic and a little bit complex. So inventory is actually one of the more complex um, topics in accounting because there's a lot of different ways of valuing it and a lot of different ways of looking at it. Uh, but we try to keep as simplified as possible, right? So, um, so before we answer that, we want to make the custom kind of client aware that there's a difference between uh, inventory you purchase versus inventory you consume or sold, right? So inventory that you sold, this is of course uh, for those established e-com owners out there that holds inventory in like warehouse or fulfillment centers. That's called cost of goods sold and it's considered direct cost. And it's subtracted from sales to get your gross profit. And you're actually allowed to take any and all cost of goods sold during the year. So anytime you sell inventory, that's a deduction to your taxable income. One thing to consider is, of course, there are different methods to value inventory. So there's, there's cost, there's lower of cost of market, and there's retail. So I will going too deep into it to, to bore you guys. Uh, this will actually control the amount of cost of good goals so you guys can take because the different ways you value that inventory means the amount, different amount of, um, the actual amount of cost that you can deduct that year. So for example, if your inventory all value very high, right? 
at the beginning, then you can take more at the beginning. But but then that means later years, you might only go to take less. So there's a lot of planning involved there. Um, and then for those of you who are drop shipping out there, uh, you don't have to worry as much. Um, obviously, when, you, when you're drop shipping, uh, your cost of goods sold is what you pay for your, to your supplier, right? So your overseas, say your, your China supplier, that's kind of like your middleman. So it, it still makes it very important to keep good records, right? Because I know uh, from my experience, um, working with someone from, uh, from China or overseas, they don't, they don't really supply you with much records. So you, if, you're, if you're someone who has made it to six, seven figures or beyond, this is most important to request some kind of uh, purchase order or some kind of proof because a lot of people, payment providers and especially the IRS are going to want to see that, that you actually, you actually have a way, way of verifying and validating that this is the cost of the inventory that you purchased. So that's something to really keep in mind. Um, also, another value add is don't be afraid of uh, having like obsolete inventory. Um, obsolete inventory is basically inventory that's dead, right? That's, that you don't feel like has any value anymore to you. Obviously, you don't want that. But that is actually something that's also uh, deductible on your taxes. If you get to a point where you can make a 100% determination that that inventory is no longer worth any value. Okay, so that's inventory. And then, uh, on to, uh, I'm guessing yep. this is so just, sorry, just to interrupt. Um, yeah, of course. This inventory stuff, is this related to the accelerated uh, deduction in the past slide? Yeah, re really good question, Jonathan. This is. So, so for, for someone that um, is looking to try to get back a little bit more after, after uh, tax money this year, yeah. uh, buying inventory in advance is an amazing way of doing that, especially if you're a cash based as taxpayer, which I'm, I'm guessing most of you e com owners are out, out there. Um, you, I would say the only case there was, there was a not be you is if you're uh, over 25 million in revenue this year, um, then you're forced to be in a crew method. So we will have, we, there'll be a whole different case in that, in that, in that, in that realm. But if you're a cash basis, uh, there's a lot of ways where you can move things around, uh, especially at year end where uh, it's all about cash, right? Cash goes out, it's an expense. Cash comes into revenue. So as long as your cash goes out in the right tax year, you can accelerate mm -hmm. that expense and get, and get more back possibly on your taxes this year. Okay. So, I mean, why would people not use accelerated? Like, won't they always use it since it's uh, more advantageous to them tax-wise? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's a really good question too, Jonathan. So there's two reasons, right? Um, when you accelerate your expenses, it's basically a planning move. So you're planning to gain that benefit now, but think mm -hmm. about it. Next year during your taxes, you may not be able to make the same move if you don't have a similar inventory value, right? Because you already, you already did that in the year prior. Yeah. So it's really about how you want your cash flow to go. Um, if you need that cash flow now, first you can need it, need it for next year, right? So if you're planning a big move right now where you need another $40,000 in cash to do other things, right? So you really want that tax refund to come back to you, then that's something that you can talk to your accountant to do for now, uh, for, for, the, for the current year. Okay. Um, okay. And then the second reason is, of course, uh, just, just a matter of cash flow, right? Do you have $40,000 <laughs> in okay, your okay. bank account to afford that inventory? Yeah, if yeah. you do, then you're in, a, you're in a really good situation. And that's something we got. We want to plan for for you, right? If we see that you have that excess cash and just sitting there, you're not putting it into other investments, for example, then you're like, okay, let's do this. Let's see how much tax saving this versus, a, hey, say you invest that money. Okay, understood. Yeah, yeah cool. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, feel free to inter interrupt me anytime if you have more questions. So we'll keep going, keep going for now. Yep. Um, question number three. So I, I, this is, this is, I get a lot. I get texts about this. I heard about business owner gets to travel for free, <laughs> but how? <laughs> I'm sure John would be interested in this too, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah, there's, there's also, there's of course business credit card hacks that you can take, but there's actually also very legit ways of doing it um, as a business travel. So um, first of all, we want to establish that, uh, you know, everything we do at FCF agency, we try to stay very, um, I would say, green, right? Uh, we, we try to stay away from anything that will get you in trouble. So we want to emphasize that for, for first of all. Um, so first of all, business owners, you do get to travel for free, but not exactly how you think about it. Okay. So let me explain. Um, so there are no free lunch in the world, first of all, right? So the way that you can travel free is this. First of all, you had to establish uh, the first requirement, which is having a business purpose, right? So you go and say you want to travel to, to a country or to a, a state, uh, you first have to be a business person. You just have it needs to be a client meeting. It needs to be a conference. You know, it needs to be uh, R and D for the business. Say you're traveling to China, to talk to suppliers. It needs to be uh, there be a potential to generate revenue, some kind of potential to generate revenue. The second requirement it's it's that uh, it's ordinary and necessary, which means like so in as part of your industry, right? Ecom, you know that people do this kind of traveling. It's not out of the ordinary, right? That you guys go to this country. Like if you right now go travel to Antarctica, people are like. What kind of what's in Antarctica for you <laughs> for your business? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah so you gotta be ordinary. 
And uh, another 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 pro tip to mention, I don't, I don't think this is something that a lot of people know about, is um, domestic international travel is different. So domestic is kind of a all or nothing rule. So domestic, if you go and travel less than fifty uh, percent, uh, you don't. Uh, sorry, if you if your if your travel is less less than fifty percent business related, mm. none of it is deductible. Okay. But if your business if your travel is fifty percent or more, then you can you can deduct all of it. Well, international it doesn't work that way. International is proportionate. So if international, if you're sixty percent of your travel is business related, then you get sixty percent. Twenty percent of it's business related, you get twenty percent. So you you really got to make that differentiation if you're traveling like domestically in the United States versus internationally. So a lot of planning involved there. And uh, the third thing is, of course, detailed record keeping. Um, you know, you don't want to get in trouble where you know you're doing this all this business traveling, but you know, of course, sneaking in some fun. Uh, but then uh, IRS like, hey, I don't, I don't actually think this is a real business trip. I think you're just going to Cabo <laughs> or Miami for fun. You know, you don't, you don't everyone gets to that, that point and you can't prove it that. So you want to gather all that vendor and client data, right? You're like, hey, I actually talked to this person. He's a, he's a representative that works for this company. And this is the time we met, you know, this is the location. Here's my receipt. You know, you, you, want, you want to have that kind of backup to uh, make it so that you, you can sleep better at night, I would say. So, um, so I mean, I want, yeah. Yeah. Just, just oh, to justify ahead, yeah. that, just to justify yeah. that, hey, I, I was uh, at this business meeting. You just got to keep records and a timeline and then put it in a yeah. file somewhere. Okay, okay. It's exactly right, Jonathan. You okay, you okay. want to make sure that you kind of jog that uh, you actually did meet with that person, right? Whoever client it was. You, if you're, you went to an event show, right? You have a brochure that says, hey, I, I've been to this. I've been to this meeting. This is the speaker that was I was listening to you okay. know, at this meeting. Yeah. What you do maybe after the speaker, maybe you go to K-Barbecue. That's on your time, right? But <laughs> yeah. hey, you, you got you got that free travel out of it because that's part of business travel. But uh, I'm going I'm to develop an example actually next of okay. how you can really uh, plan for this, okay? Okay, so Adam, uh, a client, uh, is, is a seven-figure nutritional brand owner, right? So he comes to us and say, hey, man, I got this big trip that I always plan every year. Um, he goes to us a, a basically a um, nutritional brand trade show. And he always goes to Miami every year, but he says, oh, damn, I'm so busy. Uh, you know, I never have time for vacation. And I was like, hey, um, you know, you, you can probably work, work that through the, the business trip that you're taking. That's what we told him, right? So we're like, hey, maybe you can spend the beginning and end of the days uh, doing, your, doing what you need for the trade show. But in the middle, you can kind of actually choose what you want to do. So, but basically, because he does that kind of planning where the beginning and the end of his trip is business related, the flight is covered. Mm. Because that's all, they, that's all they're gonna, the IR is going to see. Did you and, and tend to go, to go to that place for business reason? Yes. Did you, at the end of the day, did you finish your business and go back home because the business reason ended? Yes. Now, what you fit in between day three and five, that's up to you, you know? So as long as I, like we talk about, you keep all email confirmation, trade show, schedule, name the speaker who you talk to, then you're going to be pretty covered. You know, you can be sitting on this little uh, little infinity pool on the right um, <laughs> and then really enjoying your time day three and five. And, you know, that this, there, there you go. That's the free traveling. And, uh, you know, a little bit more, a little bit more a tip here. When you do business traveling, there's a lot more than just travel and meals that's covered. I think that's mm -hmm. what most people know about. You can actually, uh, if you pay any gratuity, like tips to people, your laundry, yeah. baggage fees, rental car, uh, dry cleaning, those are all deductible as long as you do them during the business part of your trip. So get them done day one and day two okay. and day six and day seven, basically in this yeah. example. <laughs> So yeah, John, if you're planning a long trip, like to, you know, to some country, yeah, like yeah. The, the Thailand or something, 10 day trip, right? As long as you're day one, day 10, you're, you're out there, you know, teaching people how to do Facebook ads. Hey, day two and day nine is up to you, bro. Okay. You know, do whatever you like. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so you should, you should plan your seminar around that, you know? Okay. Cool. Um, so we'll move on from here. So we're going to go to question number four. So next question we always get is uh, how about driving, right? Um, mileage for business purpose. So like, so say they uh, go and um, drive for the purpose of going to post office or a workplace, warehouse, a business meeting. And yeah, that's totally deductible. Like, um, so there's actually two ways of figuring this out. There's the, what they call the standard method and the actual method. So standard method is very simple and I actually recommend that for all of you guys starting out there to do your taxes to follow the standard method. And standard method is basically a rate IRS gives you, it changes every year for 2021. I just looked this up. It's 56 cents a mile. It actually went down 1.5 cents from 2020. And basically all you do is you take the mile, the miles that you travel to and from the place of business, right? Record it and multiply it by that, by that, uh, by that rate. And that's the amount of tax deduction you can take. So that's great. Um, and all, and, but then there's actually the more complex way, which is called the actual method. 
So the actual method uh, is a little bit more complicated, but it's, it actually could give you back more savings possibly at the end of the day because the actual method basically lets you deduct a lot more. So I'll show you the next slide. So the actual method lets you take all these things, right? So you can take gas, oil, maintenance, repair, registration fees and taxes, license, insurance, vehicle, loan interest, rental or lease payment, depreciation, garage rent, tolls and parking fees. So uh, obviously when, you, when you're doing all this, it's a lot more involved, but it's a great amount of categories you can take. But don't think that this is always going to be the best, better method. So I'm going to show you two examples of wh why we say this, okay? So uh, first example is, so, so you have a vehicle that you're using about 18,000 miles a year, right? A business vehicle. And you use it for 90% of the time for your business, okay? So which means about 16,200 miles each year. So if you use the actual expense method, you, you, you basically go and log, you know, how much gas and oil you take, registration fee, insurance, uh, loan insurance, uh, interest, excuse me, lease payment and total expense. So with that said, your total deduction is about 8,640, right? But then the standard mile method, which is a lot simpler, you're, you're literally just taking the actual business mile you have, which is 16,200. You're timing by the mile trade. Oh, this is, this is my apologies. I should update for 2021. But for 2020, is 57.5, so a little bit higher. So then your total deduction is, uh, you get to take is 9,315. So you can see, actually, you're doing all this work, but actually the standard mile wins in this case, right? But let's, let's switch it up. Let's say you are a person who are actually driving a more of a luxury vehicle, right? Or just a, a bigger van or something that you need to, to store all your inventory for stuff, for example, right? So in the, in the luxury vehicle example, all your, all your things are more expensive. You know, your gas is more expensive, your registration fees more expensive, insurance, your lease payment is 1200 a month because say you, you're a big baller and you have a Mercedes Benz, right? So your, your lease payment is a lot higher. Well, look at that. Your total expense is just 24000 so if you, if you take that expense and multiply it by business use, which is 90%, you get 22,000 of possible expenses here. So, but then if you only did the, the actual business miles method, that's only gets to need about 9,315. So you can see there's a big difference here by not checking if the actual expense method is the right, right one for you. And I, I feel like a lot of times when you go to uh, an accountant that, you know, that doesn't really, uh, you know, how busy who doesn't really like look out for your business, they will just do the standard miles method no matter what, right? Because it's easy. You don't even need to pay someone to do this, honestly. Like you can, you can calculate this yourself, right? You just have to good, keep good mileage records and multiply it by rate and there you go, right? And that's sometimes okay, but sometimes you can be missing out almost $10,000 in tax deductions. So you can see a big difference there, right, Jonathan? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, so, okay. You have any yep. questions there, Jonathan? No, nope. move okay. on, okay, okay. So next we have, my business is growing. Question number five, can I hire family members to help? So we get this question a lot about, you know, I want to hire my, my, my nephew, son, or, you know, third cousin twice to move. Is that okay for my business? And that's actually a legitimate legal tax deduction you guys can look into, especially if you're running a family business. So it's, it's, a, it's a concept called family income splitting, right? And basically it allows you to split your income so it doesn't all get taxed at the higher bracket. So it actually allows you to basically keep more of your after-tax profit. Uh, but it's one thing you got to watch out for is the, what, what they call the kitty tax. So kitty tax is basically in the 1980s, people started abusing this. <laughs> they started saying, hey, I have a kid who's like five year old. Let me make, make, make him an uh, employee of my company and pay him $100,000 for you know, opening mail or some, some, some dumb things like that, right? Yeah. And IRS and Congress basically caught on and say, hey, you can't do that. That five-year-old should not be first or a child labor law. Should not be working for your company eighty <laughs> hours a week. So you cannot pay one hundred thousand dollars to do the simple things, right? Yeah. So the kitty's tax basically is saying that uh, whoever's working for your company, they need to be legitimately doing something for your business, right? They need to be running logistics, running marketing, and they need to pay a market rate for it. So basically, they're saying no one's going to pay a five-year-old one hundred thousand dollars. Is what they're saying. Therefore, if you try to get around this and pay a five-year-old that, they're going to catch you and call it a kitty tax. And you get taxed at your rate anyway. So it's not worth it doing it that way. So if you're going to hire someone, basically you need to hire someone that is actually doing work for your business. Okay. So just want to give you an example. So we have Steve, who is an e-commerce owner, making 300K a year. And this is a, uh, a, a tax bracket that we have here. And basically uh, he decided that, hey, I'm, I'm going to be hiring my daughter and then my nephew, Greg, to do two uh, legitimate things for my business, right? Uh, so my Sarah is going to run social media for me. And Greg's, and Greg's going to do fulfillment. And we're going to pay, I'm going to pay them 50000 each. Um, but, but you can see by doing this, the 100 k now is allocated to the 22 percentile and not to the 35%, which is what he would have got taxes for all $300,000 of his net profit. 
Mm. But by splitting it, some of it's only going to be taxed at 22%. So he realized the 13% difference in between those two brackets, which is awesome. And just it's something that you can definitely do if you have a lot of people working in your, in your company. So don't be afraid to hire your family members to get them okay. to help out. Okay. The next question we have, uh, this one's really popular now that we're in the COVID environment is, you know, I'm working from home. Well, what kind of deductions can I take? And uh, there's a very, very, very in-demand question in our agency lately, and we have done a lot of research on this actually. And the good news we want to tell you is there is a home um, offer deduction that you can definitely take if you're an online business owner. And to qualify this, basically you just got to meet two conditions. Uh, one is you need to have regular and executive use for your business, which means that the space has to be for business use only. So basically it has to be an office space dedicated to your business. It can't be a nursery, you know, it can't be uh, anything else, right? It, it can't be your dining room also. It has to be a space that's just for that. And the second requirement is it, it has become now your principal place of business. So basically you can't have a home office and also have an office outside of this office also. So that's something you just got to keep in mind when you're running or you want to take this deduction. And just like with, with mileage, there's actually two ways of taking this. There's, there's the easy way of doing it, uh, which is just taking, uh, actually you get $5 per square footage and then you just, and then you get up to 300 square foot of your house, right? So you just five times 300, that's the maximum deduction you take. But then there's also the more complicated method, which is also called the actual expense deduction, which you can deduct the actual percentage of business use that your business take up in your home. So you can take up a, a however, however much your business take up in your home, you can take a portion of your mortgage in, interest, any kind of taxes, like property tax that you paid, maintenance and repair that you get that you guys do, insurance, utilities that you do. So that's actually could add up to a lot of deduction that you can possibly take. So that's something that you want to really watch out for, especially if you have you are you know you are using more than 300 square foot of your home for your business. Yeah. Um, you want to see if you can talk to an accountant that can help you take some of these other uh, things for your business, and that can add up to a lot more than the um, just a simple method of taking this deduction. Okay. Okay. Um, next, we have question number seven. Why set up an LLC? What are the benefits? So, you know, without going too much in, into it, uh, you know, some some of the some of the some of the benefits that you guys might know about, is, of course, the the limited person limited personal liability that you get that you get. So, basically, I see a lot of people that starts out as entrepreneurs, right? That uh, that keeps everything in one their personal account, and that's very dangerous, actually. Basically, if they say you run a toy company, right, and you get sued, right, because one of your toys is toxic, it's from China, and a, a kid gets sick because of it, what the parents can do is basically sue you and sue, sue your entire person, which means, uh, you know, if they win the lawsuit, they can go after your house, your mortgage, your car, your boat, uh, everything that you own, basically. And you don't want that. What, that's why people set up LLCs. LLC basically provides that, that shield against that kind of thing. When you have an LLC, um, the parent or whoever, whoever it is, it's an example, can only sue your LLC, which means that um, they can only take up as much as business asset that's in your business. And they can never touch your personal stuff. So you want to make sure that there's that really good distinction between business and personal, because if the court finds that you guys are mixing the two, that's really bad. Then it's a concept called, called piercing the corporate veil and they can come, come after you too. So just a, a pro tip that we always recommend clients is please, for the love of God, separate your, your expenses out. <laughs> make sure you have a business account and a personal account. Don't mix the both. Don't commingle. Don't, hey, hey, I want some points. Let me put it on my business account. Don't, don't do that because that'll just get you in trouble. Okay. And the other thing is, of course, no double taxation. Um, you know, uh, LLC is a lot easier as far as paperwork. Um, if you if you go and set up what, what they like, what and, and if you really incorporate and become a C corp, right, a corporation, uh, you get taxed two levels at the shareholder level and also at the personal level. But LLC does not that. There's no uh, and the third thing is there's no restriction on number of type of owners. So you can actually take in uh, owners of the entities. You can take in international owners too. It's just, you got to do a little, a little bit more uh, paperwork and, and distribution types than doing that, but you can. And of course, flexible profit distribution is the last benefit of LLC. So what, what that means is say you both go, you and your partner both go into business, but that guy only want, only has enough to put in $2,000, right? And you can put in $10,000. Well, that still means that you guys can do a 50, 50 split of the business. And that doesn't mean that how much you put in is how much you need to split a profit. It's, it's totally up to you how you how you want to distribute that. So a lot of flexibility there. And it doesn't have to be a proportional amount of contribution. Mm. Cool. And yep. then, yep, we're going to go to question number eight. Oh, man, question number eight is one of my favorite questions. So I'm making money now. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm rolling in this dough. Like, how do I stretch this dollar to make it last longer? So that's something that's one of my favorite topics, actually. 
of uh, helping clients realize that, you know, they're doing great in their business and that's awesome. But I'm sure a lot of them are hoping for the day where they can just sit back and really enjoy the fruit of their labor, you know, really get to enjoy themselves. So something that we always go on, get on a, a call with them is talk about like a retirement options they have. And there's a lot that they can do, um, a lot of different plans that they can do, even as a small business that they can look into like 401k, uh, SEP IRA, Roth IRA, that they can really set up for themselves to not only possibly reduce their tax situation now, but they can also invest that money, let it grow tax-free and really set themselves out when they, when they want to retire one day. And another thing that uh, hopefully someone talks to you guys about, it's just what we call HSA. It's a health savings account. Uh, it's basically another investment vehicle that the government allow you to do that lets you not only put in your money tax-free, let it grow tax-free. And at the end of the day, you can take it out tax-free for any kind of medical health related reasons. So that's, that's powerful. You, you guys, if you're in the United States, you know how, uh, you know, not that great the medical system is in the U.S., right? In some other countries, you get free medical care and that, but in the U.S., you really got to prep for that. So uh, health saving account lets you basically not have to worry about that piece. Like when you get older and you actually need the medical uh, expenses, you can draw from this account at that point. And hopefully at that point, your account has gr grown to a good amount where you can afford all that without any problem. Um, another thing we always talk to our client about is asset diversification, right? So don't just focus on one stream of income. Yeah, we know your brand is doing great, but now that you have this extra cash flow, you should think about putting it in real estate. You should think about putting it in stocks, bonds, ETFs. Make sure that you have a diversified stream so then you're well taken care of no matter what happens to your business. Um, most of our streams of income, uh, we always try to explore different ways that they can look at into affiliate marketing, merch, uh, anything that's you know, not their primary business. You know, maybe they can do, go do uh, as an event speaker. I know that's a very popular, right, popular role right now. Um, and then at the end of the day, we just want to help you find passive income, right? Things you can do on, on, your, on your boat, <laughs> on a beach somewhere, and just earning money for you while you do anything, you know? And that's what we want to do. And the last thing is, you know, if you still think your business is very viable, you want to just hire an amazingly talented team to take over for you, you know? So at the end of the day, you just have to look at your financial report, you know, that your accountant gives you and say, hey, this is how much your business is making a day. Your tax situation is taken care of. You're good to go. You, you can keep going on your vacation because you have a, a great team that you're taking care of all that for you. And that's very comforting as a business owner who has, who has done this for a while. And can I ask, right? Um, yeah, of your HSA, so in Singapore, I think it's called CPF. I think it's the same thing, but basically you put okay. in uh, money and then you uh, invest it tax-free, um, mm -hmm. right? So yep. but is there a cap to how much you actually can contribute to this account? Yeah, there is actually. So there's, a, there's an individual cap that uh, it's about, I think it's about 7,100. And then if you're married, it doubles that to about 14,200. 14, Something around year? there. It's, it, it changes. It, yeah. Yes, per year. Okay. So it, 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 it changes. It, there's a little bit of inflation that Congress or Congress changed that every year. But basically, you can, you can, you can if you especially have the cash flow, to cap out on it. Because mm. it basically helps you lower your, your taxable income that you have this year by that amount, right? So say 7,100. And then not only that is you can put that money in. It will grow tax-free. And at the end of the day, you can take it out, all of it tax-free, for mm. any kind of medical issues you have. So it's really amazing. And it's oh, so something only that for medical, like, only for hospital stuff, bills. Yes. Only for any kind of medical uh, things is tax free. But okay. uh, if you don't, I think it's like a 10% penalty, which is, which is not as big a deal as you think once you let it grow for 10, 20 years. Okay. So, uh, just last question. Sorry. The asset yep, diversification, right? Would you recommend um, buying like bond stocks within your company or do you take it out after tax profit? Then you go and invest. Like, can you actually yeah. invest uh, company money and then, let it sit in within the, the LLC. So um, you can uh, you can invest on behalf of your LLC. Uh, it just depends on how you set up your LLC, right? Because you got to think of LLC as not just your own, especially if you're not a single member LLC. Mm -hmm. If you have multiple members in your LLC, you have a lot of partners. Uh, all those decisions you can make as long as you can make as a group, right? So uh, what, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, uh, you you can do that. It just as long as you get along really well with your partners and your members and you guys can always come to the right, the, the kind of investment decision you want to make yeah. together, I would recommend this path. But uh, I hardly see businesses in that setting, right? Where everything is just harmonious, where everyone just want to yeah, invest yeah. in the same thing, right? So say I want to invest in Tesla, but you want to invest in uh, you know some other company, right? We might might disagree. And because you're using company money might, might actually create more, uh, I, I would say, uh, controversy and yeah. argument, but you can. It's, it's totally fine, but I actually would recommend that you take the, 
uh, after tax profit of your own and invest it because you have more control over it. You can, you can do more what you want with the money. That's my recommendation. Even if, uh, for example, like you are a uh, like sole entrepreneur, right? You're doing LLC, you're making like $4 million on Shopify per year. Is that Does that still make sense? Or you, you still should probably just take it after tax profit and invest that? Yeah, so th- that's a that's a that's a that's a concept that uh, a lot of people don't 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 know about is if you're a sole proprietorship, even if you have oh, an no, LLC, no, no, not not sole prop, oh, but more like uh, your one man LLC, like you're yes, the sole ex- owner. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I misspoke. If you're a one man LLC, they basically what they call it is a disregarded entity. They're basically saying because you're only one person, the LLC really doesn't uh, take as much effect. If that makes sense, it's like they see you as just an individual person. Uh, basically disguising as an LLC. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. You actually, you actually most of the time don't want to form the single member LLCs. You want to form a partnership. You want to form multiple member LLCs. So uh, they, uh, as in a court of law, they see you more as a legitimate business rather than someone who's just looking for, uh, you know, personal liability protection and forming an LLC. So okay. what I'm saying is if you're just a single member LLC, uh, it, it, they will, they will treat it the same way. Okay. Whether so you invest as part of the company or yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You should just take it out because they're okay, going to okay. make you take it out. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's, you can't, you can't hide that way, unfortunately. <laughs> Any other questions, Jonathan? No, no, no. I'm okay. Okay. Cool. I'll move on to the last two questions we have now. Um, number nine. Uh, yeah. Something that a, a lot of people to worry about is of course about sales tax, right? It says, should I be worried? And when should you be worried about sales tax? Right. So um, one thing is we want to make sure that e-com owners are always scaled to a certain point. They start thinking about this and it looks really troublesome at the beginning, right? So, and it creates a lot of compliance issues for companies that don't get a jump start on it, but there's good news. Um, most states have certain sales thresholds you need to meet before they will even go after you. So I would say that um, unless you're at, I would say like three to 500 K mark, you really don't have to think about this. Uh, really like the only state that you kind of have to think about is just your own state um, that you have this kind of issue with. So say I'm in California, right? I would need, just need to make sure I collect sales tax for California customers. And then I would, I need to file sales tax for California. Um, but for any other state, I don't think you need to worry about much until you get to a really high revenue point. And then, uh, yeah, then you probably need to look into it. Uh, but just, just don't worry about it. Like uh, one, one of the things that I, I want to mention is uh, our agency, we provide a, uh, an annual state by say sales tax impact report for you guys. So what we do is we basically analyze your entire customer list, break it out into, into states and how much impact you have per that state and when you actually need to be alerted to file for that state. So um, with that, you know, you kind of know what one point you need to worry about it. And then if, if you don't actually meet that certain sales volume per state, you can just kind of forget about it. So yeah, not, not too much to worry about anyone that's making, I would say less than three to 500K. This per year, right? 500K per year? Per year, yep. Okay. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. If you're making three to 500K per month, uh, you really need to start worrying about this now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> give give account a call like today. <laughs> you don't want to hesitate if you're making that much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because that's over 6 million a year, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, great. And now last but not least, uh, this is just a little plug that we have for ourselves. Uh, you know, why should I hire you, right? Why shouldn't I go and just hire someone that just a, you know, family friend or someone that's recommended to me or someone I Google? Uh, I, and I hope uh, from all these questions that you've seen before that you kind of get an understanding that uh, it's not it's not so simple to just hire someone who's just a tax preparer, right? So, someone who's just a tax preparer, uh, most of the time is just going to take the number you give them, put it on some sheet and say, bam, this is how much you got to pay. Like, there it is pay that amount, you know, and that's, that's fine. But you can see that you're actually missing out on a lot of possible deductions this way, you know, just with that income statement example at the beginning, just with the, the, the actual, the, the mileage you saw, just with the um, home deduction, there, there's always different methods of calculating those things. So if you don't do things like proactive tax planning, you're very likely to miss, miss out on those things. And you also want someone that's really laser focused on your niche, right? So a lot of accounts I see are generalists. They'll take on any kind of clients, right? Retail, brick and mortar, uh, real estate, just uh, some, some fruit stand in, in the streets. You, you don't want that because they, they're just gonna apply really general tax knowledge to your business. You want someone that's laser focused on online business. Why? Because the IRS tax code is 
it's it's not that complicated. It's just it's just thousands of pages. That's all. <laughs> you want someone that's like only reading the part that's related to you. You know, if they're if they're at, over there like talking about mumbling about things that's not related to your niche or your your brand, that doesn't help you. You know, so you really want someone that's really like like here to maximize your tax deduction. Like when we, when our company in our company setup, tax preparation is actually the last step. Like what we do before that is you know we prepare you, you, all your bookkeeping, we make it clean. We go into tax planning. Then we talk to you about what your goals are for the future, you know, what you want to do. And we really plan that out for three to five to 10 years and really see, hey, does that make sense in a, in a, in a legacy setting, right? And then does it make sense of what you, how you want to retire and how you want to leave behind money for your dependents and your uh, beneficiaries? So we really want to focus on that. So with that said, this is kind of like all the things that we prepared. Uh, we also want to, want to want you guys to know that you kind of want someone that has that synergy, right? That does your bookkeeping, do your tax planning, your financial reporting, and don't need to go to different sources for different things. You want someone that can do it all and can just become a one-stop shop. So you don't have to talk to, <laughs> no one wants to talk to three to five accountants, right, Jonathan? <laughs> you probably only yeah, want to yeah, talk no to way. one accountant that's no just way. like, hey, <laughs> uh, let me just do one call and I get this taken care of and I can go, go on and do my business and go back on my boat, you know? So you don't want to go and have like three to five conference calls a month. It's like, hey, I need to talk to my bookkeeper here and talk to this guy doing my sales tax. I need to talk to this guy doing my tax preparation. Nah, that's 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 a lot of headache. But, uh, and you're trying to get rid of headaches, you know? So that's kind of why a little plug here. Uh, yeah. Just want to mention that, you know, we're, just, we're, not, we're, not, we're not really just here to do your taxes. That's like the last thing we think about. We, we feel like if we had done everything else that we're supposed to, to have a deep understanding of your business, this would take care of itself as far as filing your taxes for you. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're really pretty much done. We, we actually have a lot of other questions that, that I got. Submitted. Yeah. We have questions on the chat. Uh, uh, that uh, we just want to mention uh, things that our okay. agency have I seen. <laughs> uh, but you know, if we, if we just interest, we can of course, uh, answer some of these other questions and maybe in, in another interview some other time, but yeah, just want to let you know some of the other questions that we may have gotten out from. I think, and I think Jonathan, your audience may have some questions too, right? Uh, yeah. Give me open up the chat. Wait. Um, okay. So first question comes from Aaron. Can okay, I I won't say the name. Uh, for Aaron? an okay. average hey, ecom, yeah, sorry. From an average ecom owner, what are the easiest uh, low hanging fruit adjustments that you can do to save taxes, and how much can you expect to save? Uh, yep. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So, like, two of the things that uh, we always mention, you just want to kind of like low hanging fruits, is uh, your merchant processing fee. So a lot of people don't consider this when they're filing their taxes, right? So this is like basically the fee that Shopify charges you or Stripe or like a PayPal. And you can actually deduct all that fee they charge you. So if you think about it, you run like a million or two to $2 million business, right? And they charge you three to 4% of that. That's 30 to $40,000 of extra tax deduction that you should be taking for your business. So don't forget about that. Make sure you keep all that uh, reporting uh, organized. Uh, if you don't know how, you feel free to DM us. We'll show you how to, you know, find those reports. Um, but make sure you gather all that up and then really, yeah, go take that tax deduction. It's all tax deductible as online online business. Another thing is something we mentioned in one other slide is mileage, right? So if you don't have time to, if you don't have having a chance to hire someone who, an accountant, you can just do the the simple method, right? Which is taking 56 cent, six cents per mile and just, just, just multiplying by the number of miles that you're traveling. Bam. And that's another great, easy tax deduction right there. Okay. Uh, next question. Is there any way to invest uh, the cash back into investments? Ex example stocks. Yeah. So I mean, you think you mentioned it, but I think I guess this guy wants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure. For sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's actually really highly recommended to diversify your, um, your cash flow, right? So currently in the United States, uh, the capital gain rate is a lot lower than your ordinary income, right? Ordinary income, basically your business income. Uh, but capital rate is basically, uh, capital gain rate is basically the, the amount you realize from investing in like uh, stocks, bonds, ETFs, mutual funds. So you actually really want to take advantage of that by putting money into those kind of uh, investment vehicles. So then later on, when you take it out, you actually have to tax at a lower rate at the end of the day, right? So I think um, right now, if you have, uh, if you're taking out 80,000 or less in, in your investment gains, it actually only gets taxed at, uh, if you're married, father joint, zero percent. So it's 40,000 for single, 80,000 for married, father jointly. But then between eight, I say eighty thousand, two hundred fifteen, but two hundred two hundred fifteen thousand dollars around there. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> it's around uh, just fifteen percent. That's the tax rate. So if you saw the the tax bracket we put up. It could go up as much as thirty seven percent, right, on ordinary business income. So that's a huge difference right there. Right there. Okay. Uh, next question. 
could you explain more about the 401k in the previous slide? Oh, 401k. Yeah. Yeah. So 401k and, you know, uh, SEP IRA, you know, simple IRA. There's, there's a lot of different ones that depend on your business could, could work the best for you and your employee. Actually, you can set up a plan for your employee. And basically, um, depending on what plan you choose, you need to put in pre-tax or post-tax dollars into these investment vehicles. So for example, if you're just doing a 401k, you can take you do pre-tax money. So for example, if your business is making a top line a million dollars, right? And uh, you can put in, I would, I would say like 18 to 20,000 into a 401k. Um, that means that 18, 20 thousand dollars is not getting taxed for this year. Instead, you can put it to this in full pay plan and it get, basically gets to grow uh, tax free. But then, uh, and then uh, over 20, 30 years, you'll grow to a certain amount because you know the stock market usually returns about seven to eight percent over, over life, life over 20, 30 years. And then at the end, there, you have a pretty nice uh, retirement fund there that you can take out and use. Um, I think there are ways to take it out early, but the normal retirement age that you can take it out is 65. But there are other, um, I would say, retirement strategies can allegedly take that out a little bit earlier than that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Patrick asks, when do you recommend getting an accountant? Is there a specific dollar amount you should uh, then look to get to hire one? How should I go about looking for one? Yeah, that's a great question, Patrick. Um, so it's actually recommended, and I kind of mentioned that a little bit already. Uh, you know, once you get past, I would say, the 300 to 500K mark in annual revenue, uh, you probably want to look for an accountant at that point. And maybe you don't need someone that does your taxes exactly. Maybe you just need someone that does your bookkeeping because at that point, you probably have a pretty high volume of transactions in your business. So you want to have someone that can really, you know, make sure your books are organized, right? Because mm -hmm. one of the things we always see from client is, you know, why, why is my, why, why do I not get all my deductions? Well, it's, it's one reason is probably because you have very messy bookkeeping. <laughs> and what, what messy bookkeeping does is you don't know, uh, like a certain transaction, if it's tax deductible, or if it's only fifty percent, or if it's zero percent, you have no idea. So you just you just you just go and uh, you put it down in a bucket, and it, that's not that's not the greatest plan, I would say. Once you start making real money, because you really got to think about your tax planning as just another stream of revenue for you. You you, you saw in, in our previous example, right, Jonathan, and on income statement slide, yep. like by doing great an advanced tax planning, that's that's. 40k. I mean, you would love to have 30, 40k back in your pocket, right? But not doing much work, and that's basically what happens. If yeah, you hire yeah. someone that that's... really understands your business, you can just get that back, and you're not doing that much more. Yeah. You just you just hire the right person that really understands your business. So I would say, yeah, um, if you're if you're around 300, 500k mark, definitely start looking into an accountant. But obviously, if you're in the high six figure, seven figure, you really should look for someone that seriously understands your business, uh, really want to help you with tax saving, really want to help you where. where with what you want to do in the future uh, as long as your financial plan and uh, they help you scale really. Yep. Okay. Uh, Lucy asks, even I have this question, <laughs> what software systems do you recommend personally? Uh, what type of source documents do you need to keep up uh, with and how should I go about setting this up? Yeah. Okay. Uh, software meaning like accounting system, right? Yes. I, yeah, I think so. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I think for most of you guys out there and even, even our agency uses too, is a QuickBook online is really good. Uh, it's one 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 by one industry standards as far as accounting software out there. Uh, there are of course more sophisticated software out there once your you know company grows to a certain amount, a certain size. Especially if you start dealing more like payroll and more complicated issues like issuing debt, uh, stock options, employee benefit plans. But uh, for my, I'm thinking for most of your e-com owners out there, you guys are probably not to that stage yet. But if you are, you know, talk to us. We'll we'll set you up with a, with a better accounting software. But for most of you out there, I think QuickBooks Online is a great thing to get started, and I would highly recommend that over just. Uh, keeping that in Excel, right, manually, because yep. you guys are gonna really start tripping up, and it's gonna be really hard to pass that on to accountant if you only keep your records in Excel. Um, so, uh, as, as far as payment processes go, you uh, basically just want to go and download all the monthly statements that's generated from their websites, and just keep it keep, keep your records, keep it in a some kind of secure data hub, right? So, at our agency, we we basically we take uh, the, the comp that we we take their the client's data and we really keep it secure and we really keep it ready so that if anything happens, you know, if IRS come back to us, we're always audit ready, right? So if, if you get ever get flagged and you might, if you start making seven figures, don't worry about it, right? If you if you have if you have hired the right person to watch out for your finances, your all your documents, all your backups ready, it's ready to go. So you don't have to worry about it. So you don't have to panic when something like that happens. And you're gonna fly with you're gonna pass with flying colors. Okay. Does uh does QuickBooks have payroll at this point? Oh, yeah, no. it does. Oh, it does? Uh, okay. It's an add-on. 
it is an add-on. Um, it's probably not the best solution, but I think if you're only hiring around one to ten employees, that's it per- works perfectly fine. Okay, answered. Uh, okay, Daniel asks, if we are hiring VAs and such, how do we expense this? How do you go about structuring deductions for hiring VAs? Uh, and any special scenarios? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's just a great question, Daniel. Um, so uh, hiring VAs is interesting in the world of uh, online e-commerce, right? Because uh, as Jonathan probably knows, a lot of people just hire a lot of people from overseas, right? International yeah. VAs from different countries. And uh, honestly, there's not a lot of guidance around this. The reason is, okay, when you hire a VA they're in, in the US, it's they're what they call an independent contractor. So what that means is, you know, they work for themselves and you hire them on and what will happen usually is you have to issue them what they call a 1099, right? So 1099, basically a, rep- a, a report saying, telling the IRS, hey, I hired this person, but I did not uh, withdraw any taxes for them, right? So because when you hire an employee, that's what you have to do for them. You have to take payroll tax, you have to take Medicare, Social Security, you have to take that on their behalf and take a portion of it, right? You withheld it and then you, you submit it to the government. But with independent contractor, as long as they make more than 600 more a month from you, you have to issue them what they call 1099. But that's only for U.S. Um, um, uh, contractors. Why? Mm-hmm. Because on the 99 form, they ask for a social security number. <laughs> if you go <laughs> hire a VA from, you know, Philippines or I don't know, India, they don't have a social security number. So there's no way for them to fill that kind of form. So really in that way, um, you really can't recognize them as an independent contractor. So there's a specific line on the Schedule C where you can put them on as a, basically a, a contract work, as someone who not, you're not going to be issuing a 1099 to, and you basically just lump them to a category and say, well, this is still an expense. I did hire someone, but uh, it's not someone in the US, so there's no need to withhold taxes for them. And basically, that's what you would do. And it, it actually works out better, honestly. And I can see why more and more people are hiring international, right? It's by one, it's cheaper wages, and two, mm-hmm. you can kind of uh, escape this tax situation until IRS issues some kind of more uh, definite guidance on it. I, I would say you should, you should definitely take advantage of that. Okay, so actually, if you have like a hundred VAs, it's fine. <laughs> That's no issue. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah, it really is. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I know, and uh, I'm sure one day the, the Congress is gonna be like, "Hey, this is unfair. Uh, this company can hire a hundred VAs, but for now, yeah, this is the way to do it." Okay, uh, Okay, Trent asks. Uh, you mentioned bookkeeper and accountant is different. How is uh, what's the difference? Okay, yeah, Trent. Yeah, I'd love to answer that for you. So. I mean, it's uh, in a way, it's almost like just just terms, right? But if you really want to define it, uh, a bookkeeper is just someone that's, you know, who's solely responsible for making sure you have good records, make, make sure your transactions are in order. So, uh, you know, you'll supply that person with your bank statements, your credit card, Shopify report, your merchant uh, fee report, and all, all kinds of things like that, all your expenses that you got on a daily basis. And he is basically responsible for making sure that uh, it's, it's put in a coherent matter um, while well, a tax accountant's job is to take what the bookkeeper has done and prepare tax filings for you. So in this way, if you hire a bad bookkeeper and you have messy books, it can affect how the tax accountant does his job, right? Because tax account, all tax accountant can do is take what you give him as far as a monthly report of your, your, your books and just take that and say, okay, I think you should, you're able to take these deductions. So if the bookkeeper doesn't do a good job of categorizing, uh, setting up your chart accounts, you can actually miss out on deductions that way. Uh, on the other side, of course, is you have amazing bookkeeping but you have a tax accountant who's not very knowledgeable about what's going on, what's, what's the current tax laws, what's, uh, what's, what the changes are, then they can just be like, okay, I'll just fill out what I know <laughs> uh, and, and then put it, put it on a sheet of paper, right? So you, you can actually mess on both sides. And that's why we really recommend you hire just one uh, firm or one agency that can take care of both sides for you. So, you know, that this, it could just creates more synergy and you, you kind of ensure that you won't miss out on all the tax deductions that you really deserve. Okay. Uh, okay. Last three questions. Okay. Okay. So yeah, sure. <laughs> Amanda, uh, Amanda asks, what types of services do you offer? How can you help uh, us basically? Yeah. 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 So, um, I mean, that's something that we really emphasize here at FCF agency is that we're kind of not your typical tax preparer firm that, you know, that you can Google or you can just, I don't know, even worse, like I, I heard one of my clients found someone on Fiverr, <laughs> but paid him like very little money. And then it was, it was a disaster. Okay, I, I tell you that story sometime, Jonathan. But uh, so we like to think of ourselves as kind of like your outsourced CFO, right? Kind of an extension of your brand. That's not just going to help you during tax season time, but really going to help you all year round. You know, like we want to be your kind of your reliable, trusted advisor 
that's going to be anytime you need to text us or chat to us about, hey, I have, I have something going on with my, my company. I'm not sure if I can do this. Can I set up my company in a different way? Uh, you know, can I, can I invest in these things? What do you recommend? Uh, should I buy inventory now versus later? Uh, you know, what, what, hey, I'm working from home now. What, what, okay, uh, these are all the deductions. Like, you know what? We want help you with any kind of questions you may have. And, and, not, and not just tax related. It can be bookkeeping related. It can be your financial forecast. It could be valuation. It could be when you want to sell your company. You know, that's kind of like uh, the background that I have is that we kind of want to help you in all aspects of the business. And we hope that that's something that you, if you guys are out there looking for someone that's just not there just to help you with your taxes, you can come and, you know, uh, come talk to us and we, we would love to see if we can help you out. Uh, yeah. And you mentioned before the call, uh, your partner has a uh, experience in M&A as well, right? Is it so? Yeah. Yeah. My, my partner, Stanford, uh, he's, he's more okay. on the valuation side. So he has this done uh, yeah. more on the, the uh, financial forecast uh, side of things. So he's very good at, at knowing about like valuation and how much your company's worth and your brand. Okay. Yeah. So guys, uh, if you need help with that, Ebony <laughs> can go to them. Uh, okay. Uh, second last question. Oh yeah. Amanda said uh, as well, biggest mistakes your client has experienced. Biggest, most common, I guess. <laughs> the biggest, biggest mistake yeah. is, yeah. The most common mistake is basically like Googling and hiring the cheapest person. Like I know a lot of people don't think this is a big deal, right? They're like, Hey, I, it, oh my God, it's, it's uh, February uh, time to file my taxes. So let me just go hire the cheapest person. Let me just, you know, use TurboTax or something, right? So the problem with that is doing yourself works when it's just your personal tax, right? Personal tax, there is just not as much deduction and credit as you can think about. There's still some, there's still some you can take for sure. You know, you can still itemize for taking a standard deduction, things like that. But on the business side, with the volume you're doing, with the sales, with the amount of sales that you could possibly be doing, there's just a lot more things you can miss. And missing it, is, is it hurts, you know, it hurts. We, we have clients come to us that have missed, you know, tens of thousands of deductions in prior years. And they're like, I can't believe this, you know, like they didn't yeah. check this, they didn't do this. And I'm just like, well, you went and Google or, you know, you asked your family friend who, for who they did their personal taxes and you hired that guy. That guy's not gonna know what, what, what you are. They're just gonna treat you as a, you know, a personal uh, tax pers preparer, you know, like person who just needs like, someone to fill out some uh, forms, forms for them. Yeah. So admin yeah, stuff. really. Yeah. Like it, uh, honestly, <laughs> you know, uh, just, just be frank with you, Jonathan, filling out a form is not the hard part. You know, I can teach you right now to fill out some forms, right? You can watch it on YouTube. Yeah. You can YouTube it. Like you seriously, like you yeah, can yeah. go right now and search on YouTube for someone that's like, hey, hey how do I fill out my tax form? And you can do totally do it. But the problem is, you know, if you don't understand your, your, your financial records, if you don't understand your bookkeeping, it doesn't help you. You, you could be putting down numbers that are not verifiable, meaning you don't have good backups for it. So you're just putting down a number now. That just put you at risk, first of all. Yep. That just sets you up for, you know, not, for you to have sleepless nights thinking about, oh shoot, did I put this number down right? What, I, just, I just put this number down. I hope, I hope, I hope they don't come after <laughs> me. And you don't, want, you don't want that. Like wh why would someone who's earning seven figures more want to not sleep well at yeah, night? No, you want to be yeah, dreaming you, about, yeah, yeah. you want to dream about like what boat I can buy, what Tesla I, I can be driving right now, not, Oh shoot! Am, is the IRS gonna come after me? It's gonna be like a, a Wolf of Wall Street thing, you know? It's yeah, the FBI yeah. wiretapping me, you know? Like you don't want to take that. You want to be rest easy, knowing someone who's competent is taking care of your tax and accounting situations, knowing you're well taken care of for for now and for the future. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last question from Daniel yep. again. I think this is a good question. It's two okay. parts, by the way. Okay. So the first yep. part is so Daniel has not charged sales tax in the past. So do does he owe the IRS now? Then part two is. So, uh, in the uh, coming future, he's going to charge sales sales tax, right? So, how does he uh, pay that? Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, that's a great question. So, Daniel, like, first of all, I I, I, I want to need to first understand, of course, your uh, situation, right? Um, like how much revenue you're bringing in this year uh, versus all of your other expenses. Um, but then one one thing I would just say is, you know, for whatever state you're in, I would, uh, if you're, if you're doing certain volume, I'm not sure, but let's say you're doing three to 500 K annual revenue. I would start seeing what your, what, how, what your concentration of customer is in that state. Right. So I would say if I'm in California and I have 30% of my customers that's in California, right. Then you probably can do some, uh, rough estimate, something Alfred will help you with obviously, but if you want to do it yourself, a rough estimate of, you know, you, you take the state sales tax, I think it's like 9.5. And then you multiply it by the, the amount of revenue you have taken for those customers. And you kind of get a rough estimate of how much you probably owed the state. So if you want to stay, you want to be in compliant, if you know your business is growing and you're not, you know, scaling down or anything, 
uh, you probably want to set aside that amount of money uh, in an account somewhere. So then if you do get uh, in trouble or anything like that, you do know that this is the amount you need to set aside, reserve for it. So you, you can pay for that taxes. And as far as your second part of the question is, okay, now you want to be compliant, which is great. You know, the government love people who uh, self-report, <laughs> you know, they love people who just like show up like, hey, I volunteer to pay my taxes. Don't, 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 please don't, don't come after me. They love that. They're, they're, they're very forgiving for people like that. So if you go and now uh, say, Hey, California, I want to, um, you know, start filing my taxes. That's, that's fine. Just, you know, just sites and forms, you just got to fill out and just become compliant, get a, got to get basically a, a permit to sell is what they call it and, and, and the state you're in. And then, yeah, you'll be set up and on your way. And that knows all things our agents can help you with. We can also help you turn, turn on those features and Shopify. If you don't know how, but basically you just want to be, uh, let Shopify, I think has a good feature. I think other uh, e-commerce sites have this too, where you can just set up state by state of which, sell, which state you want to start collecting based on what state they're buying it from, right? So it will recognize that that person's buying it from a California shipping address. So you need to start starting to sell tax for him. But if he's buying from a Texas shipping address, then you wouldn't collect sales tax for him until you get to a certain threshold of customers in that state. Hope that answers your question. Okay, Daniel, I hope it's okay. Yeah, uh, okay. yeah let me know if, if it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. you, can, you can always contact me later. Okay, Ken. Uh, Alan, I thank really thank you for your time. Uh, giving the audience um like tons of value and stuff. Uh, okay, now uh, feel free to plug your stuff. How how do people find you? Um, <laughs> how, how do they yeah, engage with yeah, the services? Thanks. Like, there's so many things to think about. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, appreciate it. So, I mean, I just want to mention like uh, we we love helping online e-commerce owners. You know, like that's kind of like our, our passion and kind of like what I got myself into, especially when I, you know, was doing e-commerce last year and, and saw all the headaches that tax and accounting and compliance that was was having a toll on these six seven e-commerce owners that should be enjoying the success that they have from figuring this stuff out themselves right you guys so, do SaaS as well you, right like software companies yeah um, yeah we, we also do that and basically okay. any any online business that you collect money over the internet we help yeah. you with because okay. that's that's our main focus so um you know if you are one of those companies out there that haven't really have a good grasp on your tax and accounting and bookkeeping I highly recommend you guys just set up a free consultation call with us. Um, I'm not sure if it's still on the screen, Jonathan, but basically I have my contact information on there. It's um, alan at freecashflow.com. If, yep. you want, if you want to just email me. And then I also have a Facebook page and Instagram. You know, feel free to use any channel you guys want. Okay, uh, let's if you guys are where, more, where do we find you? <laughs> Where's the number one place? Yeah, yeah you, can just, you can just email me. I think uh, that'll be probably the easiest. And okay. then, but I mean, get, you guys feel more ready to set up a call. Uh, we also have our, our site where you can just uh, click on it and set up an appointment with us directly. And then we will we'll just jump on a, a, a free consultation call with you. We'll, we'll understand your situation and we'll see if we're a good fit together. And we'll go from there. Easy as that. Okay. Ken, thank you so much, Alan, for your time. Uh, yeah, guys, we've come to the... Okay, so Alan, stop. you can stop sharing the screen again. Yeah, uh, we've come to the end. Thank you guys for watching uh, to the end if you're still here. Uh, yep. And thanks, Alan. You guys can find them at freecashflow.io slash opt-in. Yeah. So I'll put the links and stuff in the description as well. And I'll put, I, this video is really long. So I'm going to put the time frames so you guys can press uh, the questions by questions as well. Yep. Okay. So that's pretty much it. Okay. Thanks, Alan, for your time. And uh, I'll stop the recording now. Okay. Thank you so yeah. much, Jonathan. Yep. See you guys. Have a good day, everyone.